Thank you. I think that everybody who came here today came here because you knew that your voices needed to be heard. So I welcome you to that challenge. I welcome all of us to that challenge. Because although we have six very expert people here who are going to share a tiny bit of the vast amount of knowledge that they could share with you, the real experts for today's conversation is each of you. And so I want to take a moment to look around the room and connect with each of you. Because it's by this that we're all committing ourselves to this is really a dialogue. This is really a dialogue about what those of you who live with a diagnosis those of you who are in that young world, those of you who know where things went in the direction you would have hoped and didn't go in the direction you would have hoped, you know those things. And if we're going to take the challenge of making a difference, we're going to have to know that. We're going to have to make sure that we embrace what you share with us today. So we're going to start off with some information for some people that will give you background, and then we're going to move into talking with you. We have a somewhat shake us all up interesting beginning to the afternoon. We have Matthew Zachary. Matthew Zachary, an interesting person. My guess is you'll be able to resonate to some of what he shares with you today. Matthew's been passionate about music since he started taking piano lessons at the young age of 11. Ten years later, and six months shy of his college graduation, with ambitions to be a Hollywood film composer, he slowly lost the use of his left hand. He was diagnosed with medulloblastoma and was told he'd likely never perform again. Just as I read these words, getting ready to introduce him, I felt it reverberate throughout my body. What must that have been like? What must that have been like? And you're going to tell us more about that. Interestingly and laudably, 11 years, four albums, and scores of concerts later, Matthew's struggle to get busy living has inspired countless thousands of others as he will, I believe, today as well. Today, he's an award-winning recording artist and accredited thought leader in public health, specifically in the domain of the convergence of youth culture, social media, cancer advocacy, as well as innovative social entrepreneur with the launch of I'm Too Young for This marketing campaign, a program of Steps for Living, the advocacy nonprofit that he founded in 2004. He has indeed embraced everything he could to let the message he believes need to, needs to be heard, heard. So he's going to shake things up a bit. It's a pleasure to introduce him. Deepak Chopra has referred to him as a peace healer, although I don't know his whole message will be peaceful today. He is going to give us the beginning from which we will evolve together this afternoon. Please welcome. Matthew Zachary. Thank you, Barbara. Um, special thanks go to uh, Susan, Nancy, Ned, and Anne Marie for having the courage to bring me up here to uh, sort of disrupt the system a little bit and give you a little insight into where I'm at, what I'm doing right now, and how I feel that I have a lot to contribute to the young adult survivorship movement through the work that I'm doing and <clears throat> through the way that I'm trying to challenge the status quo. And someone called me the Che Guevara of young adult advocacy. I, I don't know if that's a terribly positive thing, <laughs> but uh, he, he did get a lot accomplished uh, with his passion. So a um, couple of weeks ago, I had a sort of a catastrophic experience that happened to me. Uh, and it turned out to be yet another long-term gift that keeps on giving from what happened 11 years ago. And I was inspired to actually, instead of writing a song, to write an essay. 
And that essay was entitled The Cost of Living, No Cure for Cancer. And it got pretty resounding uh, feedback on, on largely the positive side from most people. I think I was able to say a lot of the things that are on people's minds, but they're not, just not sure they have an outlet uh, to articulate them. Uh, so I'm going to read to you this essay that I wrote, um, and I'm very proud of it. I think it, it is the, uh, the decided disruptive voice for young adults with cancer. So uh, again, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I hope you enjoy it. And there's no piano, so you're just stuck with my voice. Um, I remember the first time that I sat down at a piano and asked my mother, where do you put your fingers? And uh, she showed me a simple five-note scale. And almost instinctively, I repeated it with precision. And she took a look back, and she stepped away. And she immediately turned to me and said, you're getting lessons, as if I had a choice. So at that point, I knew music was somehow always going to be a presence in my life. It was 1985. Back to the Future just came out. We want to feel old at this point. Uh, I was 11 years old. And a decade later, in 1995, my world would change forever uh, for my music and for my life. At 21, I was in my fourth year of college, six months shy of my graduation. And unlike uh, most people, I had actually realized that a career in music was entirely possible. Uh, and my dreams of composing symphonies uh, for film were drawing nearer and nearer as I had got accepted to USC Film School. I was going to study with the late Jerry Goldsmith. And I had ambitions to be the next John Williams. Um, aiming high, I suppose. Big dreams, big goals. Uh, um, and I knew with almost certainty where my life was going. Uh, I was energized. I was passionate. But I was a neophyte with dreams bigger than myself, as I think we all are wide-eyed and bushy-tailed when we get out of college. Uh, months later that summer in 1995, while interning for Dean Witter uh, out on the 68th floor of the World Trade Center and a quick non sequitur, uh, I loved that working there was, was an amazing life-altering experience just to be there, and they did have the best subsidized cafeteria on the planet, <laughs> one that will be missed along with all the other people we lost that day. Um, however, working at such altitude, I don't know if anyone ever been there, but their elevators are propelled by plutonium. They rocket you up, and, and you get this sort of weird, weird weightlessness sense. And I, I started to notice that my left hand was experiencing some, some sort of tingling and acting very strange. Uh, but it wasn't until I got back to school that September when I started playing like 40, 50 hours a week that I really started noticing that this was a significant problem that was starting to get exacerbated. Um, a major difference in the way that I was able to play. I'm also a lefty, and it started impacting the way that I was writing. Uh, the fall of 1995 was fraught with uncertainty because my left hand completely eventually lost its dexterity and failed all fine motor coordination tests, rendering this aspiring pianist unable to perform, to write, and to type. A diagnosis of brain cancer in December following four months of misdiagnosis would make strange sense of the madness when I uttered, thank God it's something. Oh, wait, it's cancer? Oh, okay, at least it's something I'm not crazy. Uh, my dreams, perhaps for now, in whatever myopic dystopic, ah, complete denial that I was in uh, would have to be put on hold. Um, now, I'm preaching to the choir largely here, but I could speak endlessly about what it felt like to be a young adult with cancer whose invincible life came tumbling down in a mere matter of moments with those words, you have something in your brain. Uh, two words, however, can sum up what I feel uh, was my personal experience back then, which was complete and total embittered isolation and absolute precocious resilience. Those are a lot of adjectives, and I said two words, so I apologize. But no fear. Strangely enough, no fear. I don't know if that was just uh, blind ignorance, deaf denial serving their purpose, but in the end, how dare this, how dare this get in the way of my dreams? I have to live my life, and God be damned if I'm going to let this stop me. So the pianist who couldn't play, and the college senior who couldn't graduate, who was told he'd never play again, and possibly would have trouble walking once again after surgery, was still determined to see through his uncertain future. So my question to the doctors, and if this is any indication of who I am and my personality, when am I going to die? And they looked at me like I had two heads. I was, they've probably never been asked that question so straightforwardly. And then I said, or is this death? 
And I feel that there's just a price to pay for surviving anything traumatic, medical or otherwise, and, and that few, if any, escape unscathed. And if you feel that you've escaped unscathed from anything traumatic, you probably need therapy. Uh, for me, uh, this process started with the intensity of the post-operative treatments. And for the record, when brain surgery is the easy part, you know you're in for a ride. Uh, so the barbaric treatments barraged upon my body for 33 torturous sessions of excessively high craniospinal radiation uh, would forever irreparably change the course of my life. Personally, professionally, psychologically, emotionally, physically, economically, and anything else that sort of fits into those metrics. Upon completion of my treatment in March, I believe it was March 30th, 1996, I had lost a remarkable 110 pounds of weight three months after throwing up for five to 10 times a day nonstop for that entire period while antiemetics, which were only first starting to come to market like Zofran and Kytril at $85 a pill, not covered by insurance, I had eroded the lining of my esophagus to the point where I had a permanent physiological and neurological dysphagia, coupled with the fact that my salivary glands were completely decimated and to date only operate at about 70%. So if I reach for this water bottle, you'll know why. And I was carrying a water bottle around before it was trendy. Uh, ahead of my time, I suppose. So I have a chronic xerostomia. I was left virtually infertile, my testicles and sperm uh, ceasing to function correctly, my brain, eyes, ears, glands, kidneys, lungs, and other chest organs now faced a potentially compromised future, chronic illness, physiological deficit, and even more scarily, a near certain and unpreventable recurrence of cancer as a direct result of not dying 11 years ago. Needless to say, I have survived, but only in the loosest sense of the clinical term. The therapy prescribed to save my life nearly ended it. And daily I realize that I'm living a life that yet may be cut short before its natural time because it was not cut short before its natural time 11 years ago. But I presently live. That's what I do. It's all I can do as best as I can. And I live a, what I'm sure many people will resonate with, a better than the alternative lifestyle. Meaning I'd rather be here with these issues than dead and useless to the world. Now at the risk of unveiling my inner nerd, I will quote Tolkien <laughs> and very briefly uh, say that we must make the most of the time that has been given to us. And uh, despite all this ridiculousness, good came out of all of this. Three years after my treatment in late 1998, I finally, it took that long, I finally got busy living and I finally was able to move on. Uh, one of the happiest days was April 1st, 1998, when I was able to record a solo piano album with music that I was unable to play but wrote in my head for the years after my diagnosis and treatment leading up to that year. The album was called Scribblings, largely because I'm a lefty and I couldn't write. So I would have these ideas in my head and I would scribble them down on a piece of paper with my opposite hand and anyone who's ever written with their opposite hand, you look like you're a two-year-old with crayons or a doctor's prescription, and they have a medical degree. <laughs> so I took my scribbles and scrawlings and scratches, and I produced an album called Scribblings, which to me was not done for commercial gain. It was purely done for cathartic psychosocial reasons. And it was probably the greatest day of my life up until that point, when I realized I can live. I'm alive. This is what my life is going to be. Um, uh, it took that long for my left hand to regain its dexterity and its professional you know, my, my high standards that I had gotten accustomed to in, grad in undergrad uh, because I didn't go to grad school and I wasn't able to play 60 hours a week. I was relegated to a desk job working in IT for the Nubian Internet back then in 1996. I just didn't get to play that often. Um, but I was able to reconcile at the age of 25 that while I may never be the Hollywood composer, at least I still had my music. Something, some anchor in the sea of chaos. Uh, a second album followed two years later, once my left hand uh, got restored to where I would consider it to be at the level before I got sick. And if anyone remembers the movie Amadeus, uh, the best compliment that I got was that it had too many notes. Uh, a third album followed soon after that, and then a fourth is pending. Uh, and so, in addition to the vaudevillian cornucopia of maladies, chronic symptoms, physiological setbacks that I had learned to live with up until that age, they were but only the beginning, nay, a staging ground for the true tests that were yet to come. 
The following is what I feel it means to be a young adult survivor. In 2003, my fertility returned. Who knew? However, and I, I, as a quick note, that was because of the organization Fertile Hope. I had met Lindsay uh, Norbeck years ago, and she was talking to me about she wanted to start this group, and I was helping uh, figure out where I could fit into that, and, and I was just a beneficiary of her philanthropy and her social entrepreneurship. Uh, she encouraged me to get tested. I got tested, and lo and behold, I was fertile for the first time in seven years. So, uh, but I will forever experience low counts, low motility, and forced to spend $400 a year in sperm banking in the event my wife and I require it, uh, or require IVF reproductive specialists, which of course will not be covered by our insurance. Uh, in 2004, I uh, was uh, diagnosed with an intermittent arrhythmia. Apparently my heart was starting to have some issues. In 2005, um, just the bizarreness of uh, getting diagnosed with uh, asiniophiliatic esophagitis, ocular and periodontal shingles, along with a chronic onset of irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, and gastritis. Yes, I'm an 80-year-old man. I just look really good. In early 2006, I began to experience catastrophic depression and mania, self-loathing. Uh, I was soon diagnosed bipolar, and it was the general consensus of my oncology providers that this was yet another gift that keeps on giving from all the brain radiation I received in 1996. In late 2006, I had a testicular cancer scare as a result of new circulatory imbalance, which I am now a medicine for. High doses of niacin also really come in handy. On March 18th, 2007, about three months ago, within the span of three hours, I spontaneously lost all the hearing in my left ear. So the pianist, who once lost the use of his left hand, was now unilaterally deaf. The diagnosis? Sudden sensory neural hearing loss, a rare geriatric condition, again, I'm 80 years old, that my oncologist, otologist, and neurologist, say that 10 times fast, confirmed with me is without a doubt connected undoubtedly uh, with the goodness that was Gamma, my friend Gamma, in 1996. Essentially, my cochlea shut down and was no longer able to communicate through the nerve to the brain. Uh, given its location, the cochlea, to where my tumor was in my cerebellum, it just made sense that uh, this was bound to happen, and I'm surprised it lasted this long. What I did find out later on is that this generally does happen in the teenage population when they have high-dose radiation when they're children, and they generally have implants. But as a quick update, because this is an older essay, I have my hearing back. I was put on um, extremely high doses of prednisone for three weeks, which if anyone here, uh, nodding heads, I see, prednisone, the, the death knell of all things that make you want to kill yourself. Um, although I didn't gain weight, uh, and the secret to not gaining weight is high doses of niacin. If, I'm not a nutritionist, but for somehow it worked for me. 1,000 milligrams of niacin didn't get a pound. And for me, that's a big deal. So, uh, so anyway, uh, I can only imagine at this point, after all this crap, what could possibly lie ahead? I mean, it's only June. I got, the, got a whole bunch of months left this year, and just year after year after year, that just things get more and more interesting. Uh, so um, is this what it means to be a young adult survivor? You know, I mean, regardless of what's going to happen to me, as long as I'm still here, I can continue to say that I'm still here. So more good came from this, beyond the music, beyond my own sort of spiritual reawakening and re-identification, and that a decade of experience, reflection, and complete disenfranchisement by the establishment, uh, again, the Che Guevara thing fits in there, yielded the birth of Steps for Living in 2004, which I had envisioned to be a nonprofit support, communications, and social advocacy agent working on behalf of young adults affected by cancer. The goal was to increase quality of life by introducing you to all the things you never knew you always wanted, and to use music and the arts to create lasting change in how the public understood what it, meant, meant what it meant to be a young adult affected by cancer. And in our small niche world over the last two years, we've been a huge hit, so much that our recent uh, youth culture marketing campaign, which is called, affectionately enough, I'm Too Young for This, uh, has fostered a complete shift of focus for the organization. Uh, Steps for Living is now becoming I'm Too Young for This, which is very, very exciting. And I think it's just so in completely in tune with the tongue-in-cheek 
self-victimization of the me generation that we all have come to know and love because we're all Time Magazine's person of the year. Uh, we're making a difference right now by fostering connections that were never made before, connecting dots between provider, patient, and resource. And we're building communities and social networks and reversing the feelings of isolation faced by so many of us. It's so far beyond you're not alone. It's ridiculous that there are so many people out there that just aren't connected. And it's so easy to get connected because we're already there. We just need to put those pieces together. So the past 11 years have played out for me as an orchestrated symphony, pun intended, of odd medical issues, rare, unique, chronic health conditions, baffling physicians, defying conventional wisdom, and wreaking havoc on my perception of being cured, which raises the controversial issue of my essay, which is what does curing cancer actually mean? What does curing cancer actually mean? Personally, I equate curing cancer with victory in Iraq. Nebulous, subjective, but very sexy, very catchy, very marketable to the masses. Something really quick and easy you can sell to people in the red states. <laughs> I remember being told by my oncologists, you're cured, go home, get on with your life, do what you got to do, have fun, have a ball. But evidently, when the doctor says you're cured, go home, that's not the end of the story. For me, and for the 70,000 adolescents and young adults diagnosed every year, not to mention the more than 600,000 adolescents and young adults who are currently under 40, living with through and beyond their diagnosis, thanks to Archie Blyer for that statistic. Now, I do not deny that the physical malignancy in my brain is gone. I am disease-free. It's been 11 years. Every year I get checkups, and there's still a giant hole in my head that hasn't filled up with nerf or anything. It's just there. I thought they put in some RAM, but <laughs> no. So, uh, so everything is hunky-dory, right? Blue skies, blue skies. I don't think so. Uh, I'm a big fan of the term remission is not a cure. I have t-shirts made up and bumper stickers made up and all sorts of disruptive campaigns like that, remission is not a cure. I don't believe that simply not dying from cancer is a cure to cancer. Uh, remission is not a cure, being disease-free is not a cure. And quite honestly, I get sick to my stomach as a veteran of Madison Avenue in marketing, when I hear organizations who are relaying, racing, running, walking, juggling, cycling, knitting, yarning, lacrossing for the cure. Um, because in my opinion, there is no cure to cancer. In the same way, there's no cure to HIV, diabetes, asthma, allergies, and autism. 15 years ago, we funneled billions of dollars into HIV AIDS research to find a cure and what was the end result. Better medicine, better technology, manageable disease, great strides, revolutionary health outcomes, social change, chronic condition. No cure. I'm not looking to trivialize, trivialize the public health impact of HIV in any way, shape, or form. And I'm specifically referring to the United States, because I think we all know that it is a huge epidemic overseas. Amazing strides have been made, but now today in this country, and I have many friends who live with HIV. They live with it. They take the medicine every day. It keeps it in check, never gets worse, never gets better. Now considered a manageable disease by the National Institute of Health, the World Health Organization, and the Centers for Disease Control, what message are we supposed to take from the public policy sector on how to understand the transition from death sentence to life sentence? People with HIV who are living with HIV are now forced to be vigilant self-advocates surveying and monitoring their own personal health, navigating their own nutritional choices, uh, dealing with uh, compromise, deficit, behavioral stigma, social stigma, ongoing medical costs, insurance issues, and endless prescription refills. Sound familiar? Those are people living with cancer, too. Today, we don't talk about curing AIDS anymore. And if we do, they need therapy. The Clinton Initiative, which I have the utmost respect for, talks about ending AIDS. I believe the semantics make a huge difference, curing versus ending. And in a similar parallel, I think I mentioned this, I have many friends who live 
on targeted therapies like Herceptin and Gleevec, Gleevec and, and Temidar and Tamoxifen, which pretty much keep the cancer in check as best as you can and extend your life and give you an opportunity to not die right away. Is this a cure? Is this the cure to cancer? Or is it the end result of better research, targeted therapy, molecular medicine? And instead of talking about the cure to cancer, should we be talking about the end of not dying from cancer? Is the cure to cancer the chronic condition? And if it is, we should just come out and say that, because I want to know what I'm racing for. And we're almost eight years into the 21st century, and for me, it seems like it's time we get with the times. It's just time. It's time to make this a national priority not just for young adults with cancer, but for all people who are affected by cancer. It should be recognized that the notion of cancer's cure has been summarily supplanted with extremely less sexy descriptions from the National Cancer Institute. Uh, although more appropriate and more relevant, it is decidedly not something for the consumer masses to understand or appreciate. But in 2003, the National Cancer Institute changed their mission. Didn't make the news. No one wrote about it, no one talked about it, just subtly slipped through the cracks. Their new mission, well, their old mission was let's cure cancer. The new mission is let's eliminate death and suffering. Party! Just not sexy enough, just not sexy enough. So if the federal focus and public policy in this country has been on survivorship for nearly five years, where does cure fit into this? And it doesn't. Cancer is the new HIV. The biology is different. The so sociology is different. But it's essentially the same public health trend. So how do we as a society reconcile the notion that the cure to cancer is still this nebulous, undecided, unagreed upon, universal, big question? We also have to reprogram our mindset from a 30-year Manchurian candidate inculcation by the status quo that promised a cure for cancer. Cure has unfortunately become, from my perspective as a marketer and an advertiser, nothing more than a catchy, exploited, arbitrary, abstract health marketing term that has lost all sense of meaning, all sense of purpose, and I'm not alone in this sentiment. Based on my work in youth culture, social media, and cancer advocacy, this is decidedly a generational argument. We have the power, we have the network, we have the community to make this our, our big flag. Perhaps someday down the road a cure may take the form of some Star Trek boop, but until that time people are still going to get cancer, and that boop by the way is trademarked so none of you can use that. Um, perhaps some genetic vaccine will come along, although Chris Rock likes to say the last thing we cured was polio, and even that's coming back. Um, but again, we're still going to get cancer. More people get it, and less people die, because of survivorship is the cure. Um, cancer just won't be as life-altering as it used to be, but it's still going to suck. You're still going to have to go through hell. But in the end, you're going to know that you're part of a community that now exists that didn't. And there are ways to connect to that community that just didn't exist before. Uh, more food for thought, if there's any scientists in the audience or any bio nerds like I was in high school, that cancer is a naturally occurring biological process that is as old as evolution itself. You can't stop it. It just exists. You can only control it and manage it. Um, and of course, the wildfire rise of cancer incidents over the past 20 years has brought utter shame and utter disgrace to the Nixon administration's war on cancer from the early 70s. I don't think that's going so well anymore. More so, the continued defunding of the National Cancer Institute budget by the current administration, which is the only administration to ever cut the budget of the National Cancer Institute, is yet another perfunctory slap in the face to the 10 million Americans in this country who are living with through and beyond cancer, as well as the 30 million people in their social network, including families and caregivers. I feel we should be riding in the streets, again, the Che Guevara comes in, and demanding answers and action. But unfortunately, we can't really do that, because we get arrested and pepper sprayed, and the LA police would beat the crap out of us. Now, 
I don't consider myself a terribly political person. Um, I'm a proud independent. I make choices based on logic, on reason, on evidence, and on just plain common sense. That said, the constituents of the entire cancer continuum, from doctors and nurses and social workers to researchers, survivors, and caregivers, we have an un unprecedented opportunity to speak with our vote next year and demand the policy changes to reverse the crap that has been thrown at us for the last six years. And quite frankly, I'm willing to bet that if the Bush twins got cervical cancer tomorrow, George W. and his unenlightened cadre of myopic cronies might actually recognize what he has done to decimate our hope in the government's prioritization of this public health epidemic. And now a quick story. I have um, sort of a funny story. Um, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, right after my surgery on January 11th, 1996. I was in neuro ICU, um, hooked up to every machine you could possibly imagine to keep me alive. I guess that's the nature of brain surgery. And uh, I was in a dimly lit room with a flickering exit sign. You could just see the Phil Noir stuff creeping in right now. And I was on a morphine drip, and I was pretty much out of it. And out of the silence came whoosh, and the curtain got pulled back. And lo and behold, there stood in front of my bed a priest with a Bible. So you know, this is rhetorical, but what do you do? So I told him, Father, I have a confession. Yes, my son. I'm Jewish. Go away. <laughs> yeah, frankly, even if I wasn't Jewish, I probably would have said that anyway. So I have the privilege and honor of being part of an extraordinary national and international social network of young adults through my work through I'm Too Young for This and our uh, social broadcast program, The Stupid Cancer Show. And uh, <clears throat> through that, I got emails a lot from people who just have a need to, to have that platform, and they just don't have the opportunity to have their voices heard, or there's nothing out there that they could sort of cling to to know that they're part of something that's bigger than themselves, but that understands them. So last month, I received a horribly disaffected and disturbing email from a friend, a young woman, fellow survivor from Texas, about he, sh how she was uh, more or less completely cast asunder and emotionally stomped upon by a nationally recognized breast cancer organization uh, for trying to be collaborative at a uh, race event. And I quote, I have to read this. On top of being told I can't be collaborative, this is also on top of not being able to participate in the event entirely because I only raised $1,100 and not the minimum of $2,100. They told me, you knew the minimum, but my response was, would you rather I not try at all? That's $1,100 you wouldn't have before, but they wouldn't take it. I just feel like what's really important, providing help, info, and resources has gotten lost somehow with this organization. I don't have to tell you who the organization was, but you can probably figure it out. But here's a sad true fact. Cancer, like anything else, is a business. And the two largest, most recognized, big box organizations out there are the strongest stakeholders in the game. And they have the most to lose by not sharing their brand equity and their human capital networks. And yes, cancer survivors, all of you, you're a market, believe it or not. These two groups, these two massive global organizations, generate billions of dollars a year. And as such, they don't have to play with smaller people who live in the sandbox with them. There's no need to. There's nothing in it for them. Um, they also have the cachet to play evolution with my friend because she didn't raise enough money and they cast her aside and replace her with someone who can. 
which I think is the coldest cut of all, but it's a game we're all catching on to. For over a combined 100 years, these two organizations have been the only game in town to associate with and to feel like you're part of a community, and that's a shame. But then recently, another organization, Think Yellow Wristband, uh, blasted onto the scene, broke the mold, made cancer kind of hip, and attracted a whole new crowd of passionate people who realized, like any other consumer-driven sector, we have choice. We have a choice. And we're witnessing for the first time, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago, how for the first time there's been a balloon-like deflation of the big box groups because people are now migrating because they realize they have choice. These groups are losing capital because they are old school and they have not kept up with the times and they have lost the pulse of the populace. They operate in a vacuum, maybe not the local, but the national do. And what do we do? How do we do this? How do we capitalize on this? We demand and change the world with our wallets, with our calendars, and with our advocacy. If you don't like an organization for its non-collaborative policies, or you want to know actually where your money goes when you give it to them, walk away and let your shadow do the talking. And then blog about it on your MySpace page. Uh, you have a choice, and there are now more choices than ever, especially in the young adult universe which is the goal of my organization, I'm Too Young for This, to basically introduce you to content you could never find. And that, unfortunately, and we're trying to change this, providers don't tell you about. So now that you know you have choices, and there are places to go to find those choices, you can make those choices. In conclusion, I am a young adult survivor because I choose to be, also because it was kind of chosen for me. I wear my experiences with pride, like a badge of honor. I'm proud of what I've been through, and like many of you, I consider it to be the best thing that ever happened to me. I hope to encourage others to stand up, get busy living, and shout to the rooftops, I am still here. And when you're young, it's terribly isolating. It totally sucks. but you're totally not alone, and there are so many ways to get connected these days that you don't even know exist. I'd also like to point out that psychosocial support and access to social networks is tantamount in health outcomes to access to quality care. I would say it's an even 50-50, because you can treat the mind and the body and the spirit individually but together they all need to be one package. And one more thought, I know there's no media here, but I like to make a point that if you happen to notice any articles that come out in the news that refer to us as victims, find that reporter and beat the crap out of them with a bag full of bricks. I don't like the word victim, even if it's a two-year-old, not victim. As I mentioned before, Cancer for me was not a death sentence, but it was a life sentence. I now have to live my life as a vigilant self-advocate, navigating the chronic and hopefully manageable outcomes of the diseases and conditions that I have to live with and that comedically enter my life every year, uh, all because I didn't die 11 years ago, better than the alternative. I'll take it any day of the week. So let's get with the program. There are 10 million, I'm not a statistics person, but I like this quote. There are 10 million of me, well, maybe not me, but 10 million sort of like me, living with, through, and beyond cancer in the United States. 10 million. And again, thanks to Archie Blyer, here's a great statistic to know you're completely not alone. 600,000 are still under 40. 1.1 million are still under 40 if you include long-term pediatrics, and three million are around if you count people who are any age but were diagnosed under 40. That's a huge community that doesn't know it exists. So in conclusion, again, think about what the cure means to you. Think about what survivorship means to you. Think about your place in the world of young adult advocacy. 
And lastly, think about where you focus your time, your passion, your talent, and most importantly, your wallet. Have, has your charity gotten with the program? Life is about choice. Remission is not a cure. Survivorship is all the rage. And I am still here. And you are still here. And this is why we fight. It ain't about the cure. Get busy living because this is life plus cancer. Thank you.